My name is Raj Saha. I'm a senior specialist solutions architect. I cover both containers and serverless. Uh, I primarily work for public sector. Uh, how many of you work in government, federal, financial, gov tech, ed tech? Nice, yeah, yeah. So we take a lot of pride on what we build. We like to build cool stuff with container and serverless, but we also want to make sure it is secure. So in today's session, I'm gonna go over best practices of container and serverless security. And we are gonna look at the traditional uh, microservices architecture for both serverless and container and see how you can think about securing those architectures. I'll start with a very famous quote from our CTO, Warner Vogel, security is everyone's job. After the session, you will see how security is impacted in every level, and this quote hopefully will be more meaningful. We always start with public sector compliance. So these are all the main serverless and container services, notably AWS Lambda, Amazon Elastic Container System Service, and Amazon Elastic, uh, Elastic Kubernetes Service and Elastic Container Service. Uh, they're all FedRAMP high, and they have DoD SRG level IL-5, IL-6. So basically they're available in GovCloud, as well as our secret and super secret region. So let's start with the serverless shared responsibility model. When we move to serverless service such as Lambda, Step Functions, or even Bridge, AWS takes on an even greater share of responsibility for security operations. But this does not mean that security is free. Looking at the shared responsibility model, customers are still responsible for securing data, managing their application, internet access, and other needs. So let's actually take a look at a serverless ecosystem or one of the most popular serverless architecture. So let's say you have a website hosted in your S3 bucket, exposed through Amazon CloudFront, and for dynamic, dynamic content, you are calling API hosted on API Gateway, which is calling AWS Lambda in the backend, and the Lambda has business logic, and it is uh, grabbing some data from DynamoDB, Aurora Serverless, etc. So when you look at this architecture, you have to think of different points where you should secure this. So one of the critical component is Amazon API Gateway. So let's take a look at how you can secure Amazon API Gateway. So you can secure Amazon API Gateway using API Key, AWS Identity and Access Management or IAM, Amazon Cognito User Pool, Amazon Cognito Identity Pool, and AWS Lambda Authorizer. So I'm going to go through each of these with a little bit of pros and cons. So the first one is API Key. So in this approach, using API Gateway, you can generate a static key and whoever wants to invoke the API will pass that API key in the header of the API call. Amazon API Gateway will validate it and then call the backend. So what is one of the pros of this? Super easy to set up. If you are trying to get your feet wet, you can do this, especially in sandbox and test environments. And what is one of the disadvantage of this? Well, the API key is kind of static, so if it gets compromised, anyone can abuse and call your API. So let's move on to AWS identity and access management. So in this case, you will use one of the IAM users who has the policy to invoke your API, their access key and secret access key. Similar approach as in you will pass the access key and secret access key in the header of the API, once the call comes to the API Gateway, API Gateway will validate it with the IAM, then it will call the backend Lambda function. So until the previous slide, there was no user ID and password involved. So how would you integrate user ID and password? So you can do that using user pool authorizers. So in this case, we are using Amazon Cognito, which is AWS's native identity provider service, and we will assume you have your user ID and password stored in Amazon Cognito user pool. So in this case, your application first will authenticate with Cognito user pool. So at this step, it is basically exchanging the user ID and password with a short-lived JWT token or JSON web token. 
And then the application will call the API Gateway API and will pass the JWT token on the header of the API. So API Gateway will validate the identity token and then if it goes through, then it will invoke the API call. Now let's go one level deeper. So what if you want to utilize user ID and password you already saved in Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple. So you probably use this in a lot of websites. So whichever website you go and say you want to log in using your Google password or Amazon password, it actually uses this flow. So in this case, you authenticate using the system of your choice, maybe Amazon Cognitive User Pool, Facebook, Google, etc., and then you will get a JWT token, and then you will request AWS credential from the Cognito Federated Identities. And in return, the Federated Identity will validate the ID token and give you temporary AWS credentials. And then your application will call the Amazon API Gateway using that secret key and secret access key. And those will be short-lived because the JWT token and the Amazon Cognito Federated Identity, the credentials they're generating will be refreshed. When the call comes to Amazon API Gateway, it will check the IAM policy with the IAM. And if the call is good, then it will invoke the Lambda function and Lambda function will execute the backend. Now this is probably the most popular method used in a public sector. So let's say you already have user ID password saved in some third party identity provider such as Okta, Auth0, or Microsoft Active Directory. So in this case, first your application need to authenticate with that external identity providers, as in exchange user ID password for a short-lived identity provider token. And then you will call the API, and again you will pass the identity provider token into the header. But note that on the previous use cases, we did not need to have any lambda in between to go and validate. Because Cognito is an AWS native service, we don't need an orchestrator in between. But for a custom authorizer, since the external identity provider is not a native AWS service, you need a custom Lambda function. This Lambda function grabs the token and validates it with the external identity provider. And if everything is good, this Lambda function will generate and return a IAM policy which will go back to the API gateway, which will validate with IAM, and if everything is good, call and invoke the Lambda. Uh, so a couple of things to keep in mind. So this, you might be thinking, this is inefficient to call this for every invocation. So you can actually cache the response based on a header field. So if I go back to the previous slide, uh, on number four, you see we always first check the policy cache. If it is already validated based on a header field, then this custom Lambda authorizer don't need to go validate it again. And you can specify how long this cache should be kept. So going forward, and uh, also this Lambda authorizer is called asynchronously, so it's not called synchronously with your backend. Uh, so the backend function doesn't wait. It only gets invoked after the authentication is through. All right, now let's take a look at API private integration. So when it comes to private integration, sometimes folks confuse between private endpoint and private integration. So private endpoint is when your API can be called privately, such as within the VPC, peer VPC, or direct connect on-prem. Private integration is the back end of the API. So private integration means you are calling the backend, maybe a Lambda function or Kubernetes service within the VPC, right? The traffic does not go through internet. So how can you achieve that? So you achieve that using VPC link for REST API. So in this case, we have a VPC link from Amazon API Gateway, which ends in a network load balancer in the VPC. And this traffic is tunneled through, 
And then you can use any service you want with, from that network load balancer. So in this example, I want to invoke EC2 from my API. So VPC link, network load balancer, EC2. Uh, what if you want to expose your Elastic Kubernetes service using an ingress with application load balancer? So everything needs to come through that network load balancer. So in this case, API gateway, VPC link, network load balancer, application load balancer, and EKS. One thing to keep in mind that this VPC link and network load balancer is reusable. So if you have multiple APIs, you do not need to create multiple VPC links. Now let's take a look at resource policies. So resource policies control who can invoke the API. So maybe you have two different VPCs, VPC A and VPC B, and you only want VPC A to invoke the API and not VPC B. You can control it using resource policy. So this is a screenshot from the API Gateway console. You could see I have resource policy selected. Using resource policy, you can control which AWS account, source VPC, or CIDR IP addresses can invoke this API. In this particular example, all the connections will be denied unless the traffic comes from this particular VPC ID, and whichever traffic comes through will be allowed to invoke the API shown in the second section. All right, so now we secured API Gateway. Now let's move one level deeper to AWS Lambda. So AWS Lambda also has resource policy and IAM role. So you folks probably know about IAM role. This one is pretty popular. So IAM role controls which other AWS services this Lambda can invoke. So if your Lambda wants to invoke a specific DynamoDB table, S3 bucket, et cetera, you can beg that using access policy and trust policy in the IAM role attached to the Lambda. But this Lambda also has a resource policy similar to API Gateway, which can control which services can call this AWS Lambda. So let's say you have two Lambda functions, Lambda function A and Lambda function B. And you want this API app A to invoke Lambda function A, but not Lambda function B. So using the resource policies of this Lambda function, you can control that. So a sample resource-based IAM policy will look like this. So in this case, I am allowing a S3 bucket to invoke the Lambda function. So you can go granular, like which API, which other, which sub-bucket if you want. Uh, so this is a very powerful tool. Now let's go into AWS Lambda security. So we always recommend to code, uh, the scan the Lambda code. You can use third-party tools like Twistlock, Snake, Aqua, etc., to do this. If you want the traffic to be private, so let's say you have uh, uh, some resources running in a private VPC which does not have any internet access due to internal IT governance request, using AWS Lambda VPC endpoint and using a private link, you can create a connection between these two. So this re doesn't require any internet gateway, NAT translation gateway, and or public IP address. So now go the last level where the AWS Lambda is doing create, read, update, delete operation from the database. So how do you access a database from your code? So your database will have a username and password so handling this properly is very important. So here is a code snippet of how you'd usually connect to a MySQL database using Node.js. So how should you access these credentials in your code? I mean, you could, of course, hard code them. We do it because it's easy when setting this up, but we know it is bad. Human readable secrets are always a bad idea but also you may accidentally publish them in your repo for other developers to see, sometimes the entire world to see, like I have done on the code. So this is not a good approach. The next approach is using environment variable or config file. 
But the problem is, there you have to encrypt the environment variable and the config file yourself. So you can do it, but there is some work involved. So the best and the recommended way to do it is using AWS Citrus Manager. Citrus Manager provides both simplicity and added security. So AWS Citrus Manager, oops, um, there we go. So AWS Citrus Manager takes care of storing the credentials securely. You can retrieve easily with SDK method. You can control access with IAM. Remember we talked about IAM roles. So if you have different lambdas and you want them to access different user ID and passwords stored in Citrus Manager, you can control them using different IAM policies. And you can also rotate the secrets in the Citrus Manager. So this is the recommended way to access user ID and password for your database. Now let's take a look at some common vulnerabilities, such as DDoS, cores, cross-site scripting, etc. So let's address DDoS first. So who here has dealt with DDoS? All right. And who here has done DDoS? No need to answer that question. So those who are not familiar with it, distributed denial of service attack is a malicious attempt to disrupt normal traffic by overwhelming the app with traffic from a lot of sources. Attacks can target your APIs, your cloud fund distributions, and your root 53 hosted zone. The first best practice is to avoid exposing your API gateway directly to the public. Your API gateway should be accessed via CloudFront exclusively. So in this way, you reduce the attack surface, and also CloudFront is integrated with Amazon Shield, which gives you protection from DDoS. Beyond that, you can also integrate AWS WAF or web application firewall to protect your system from other attacks. So this is a sample access control list in AWS WAF. So we can see we have four rules. In the first rule, we are only allowing requests from US. The next three rules are for no cross-site injection, size should be less than one kilobyte, and no SQL injection. So like we said before, apply security at all layers. So we talked about API Gateway, AWS Shield, WAF, Lambda, how do you access database, etc. So we have a well-architected framework tool, not to be confused with a WAF tool for security, where you can go over the serverless lens, especially the security portion, and you could see where you answer different questions like how do you control access to your serverless API, how do you manage your serverless application security, et cetera, and find out the security posture of your application. All right, so now switch gear to containers security. So let's start with shared service model. So with Amazon EKS with self-managed worker nodes, AWS manages Kubernetes control plane, API server, controller manager, scheduler, and etcd and you manage the worker node, the operating system, AMI configuration, et cetera. Now going one step further, you can use Amazon EKS with managed node groups. So here also, we manage the control plane, and we help you with AMI configuration and operating system. So I'm gonna cover this in a little bit. Similarly, let's look at an architecture of a container project. So you have a VPC where your EKS cluster is running, and your repository is Amazon Elastic Container Registry, or ECR. So you have the container image for your application saved in that uh, ECR, and you have multiple EC2s running as the worker plane of your EKS cluster. And containers run inside a pod in EKS. So let's say you have multiple pods running within these EC2 instances, and your container runs inside this pod. Now ideally, this should all be running in private subnet, and you expose them using a elastic load balancing, either application load balancer or a network load balancer. For, for application load balancer, you use ingress. <coughs> 
So this is the high level flow of a container microservice. So some stuff we already know at this point. We looked at how you can use web application firewall or shield. You can integrate those with elastic load balancing. You can also integrate Amazon Cognito with elastic load balancing. If needed, you can also use Amazon API Gateway in front of your ingress. So if you like Amazon API Gateway features like throttling, bursting, a payload validation, or custom authorizer with or working with Okta Active Directory, you can use API Gateway with Kubernetes as well. So when it comes to security of container-specific areas, these are the main areas to look at. Security of your container image, infrastructure security as in the EC2s where your containers are running, pod and runtime security which are running your application container, network security as in the communication between different pods, and audit and forensics. All right, so let's go one by one. Let's start with image security. So when it comes to image, you always should scan your images for vulnerabilities or CVE. So you can do ECR basic scanning. This is provided free of cost. And this scans for any vulnerable operating system packages. Alternatively, you can use ECR enhanced scanning, which scans for both operating system and programming packages. So this uses Amazon Inspector. And when it comes to uh, containers, you should always look at minimizing the attack surface of your containers. So what does it mean? So what it means is take out unnecessary packages that you don't need to run your application. When you run a Docker file, generally each command in the Docker file creates a layer in the container image. So you should always look to minimize the size, not only for security, but also for performance. So we call this technique multi-stage build. So think about your Go application or Java application. So you have your code, then you grab some external libraries, and then you compile it to an executable. If you think about it, when you have the executable, you no longer need the code and external libraries included in the container image. You could just have the executable that can execute your code. So using multi-stage build and taking a scratch as in very basic container image, just bake your executable, that will minimize the attack surface by a lot. Some of the distroless images don't have a shell or package manager, leaving an attacker with very little to exploit if there is a vulnerability in your application. And when dealing with containers, always run the application as a non-root user. This can be enforced with one line of code in your Docker file, but we're also gonna look at some of the other techniques. What if your team does not control uh, the Docker file and you can uh, prohibit from a root user to run using other techniques during runtime. But during Docker file, you can link to your Docker files with Docker or Hadolint to check if it is indeed using root as the user. You should always defang your containers. So what this means is uh, if an attacker comes in and escalate the privileges, the attacker can get out of the running container and can actually access the underlying virtual machine. You don't want it to happen because this is very dangerous. And you can remove files with set UID and set GID bits from images. So these are the two components that is necessary to escalate the privileges. So when you remove these components, the attacker cannot uh, escalate the privilege. And finally, uh, when you save your container images into Elastic Container Registry, use private endpoints. When you enable AWS Private Link for Amazon ECR, VPC endpoints appear as Elastic Network Interfaces with a private IP address inside your VPC. 
Since we released AWS private link support for Amazon ECR, our customers have told us that they would like the ability to control access to the Amazon ECR registries through the VPC endpoint using IAM resources policies. So what this means is you have a container image in the ECR and you only want specific IAM role or AWS account to access it. So on top of having uh, private ECR endpoints, you can attach endpoint policies to control which IAM role and AWS accounts can pull the images. All right, now let's move on to the infrastructure security. So by infrastructure, we mean the infrastructure where your containers are running, such as Amazon EC2. So when it comes to running an operating system, always use an operating system that is optimized for running containers. So Bottle Rocket is the newest feature uh, from, uh, from AWS. Bottle Rocket is a free and open source Linux-based operating system meant for hosting containers. To improve security, there is no SSH server in a Bottle Rocket image and not even a shell. But don't panic, there are a couple of out-of-band access methods you can use to explore Bottle Rocket like you would a typical Linux system. So either option will give you a shell within Bottle Rocket. From there, you can change settings, manually update Bottle, bottle Rocket, debug problems, and generally explore. Next best practice is upgrade to latest AMIs. So if you are using uh, Amazon Linux image, uh, AL2, EKS optimized AL2 or Bottle Rocket, uh, we provide you with AMIs and with Kubernetes upgrades, we provide you with upgraded AMIs. So always make sure to upgrade to latest AMIs. So when it comes to upgrading AMIs, uh, we make it easier for you by using managed node group. So, so when you upgrade AMIs, you don't want your application to go down. So managed node group uses a rolling deployment, keeps your application up and running, and it brings up new EC2s with the new AMIs and slowly drain the outdated EC2s. Always deploy workers into private subnets. Uh, so if, we, if you deploy your worker nodes into public subnet, they will get a public IP address, which is not advisable, like I showed in the microservices architecture. Deploy it on the private subnet and expose it using ingress. If you choose to deploy your worker nodes on a public subnet, implement restrictive AWS security group rules to limit their exposure. Um, always minimize access to worker nodes. Instead of enabling SSH access, use SSM Sessions Manager when you need to remote into a host. Unlike SSH keys, which can be lost, copied, or shared, Session Manager allows you to control access to EC2 instances using IAM. Moreover, it provides an audit trail and log of the commands that were run on the instance. Manage node group support custom AMI and EC2 launch templates. This allows you to embed the SSM agent into the AMI or install it as the worker node is being bootstrapped. If you rather not modify the optimized AMI or the launch template, you can install the SSM agent with a daemon set, and we have samples for that in GitHub. And finally, run KubeBench to continually assess alignment with Amazon EKS CIS benchmarks. Uh, so KubeBench covers both the control plane and data plane, but since with Amazon EKS, we take care of the control plane, uh, there is a modified EKS uh, uh, KubeBench just to run on EKS on the GitHub. Also, one thing to keep in mind, KubeBench scans the cluster configuration. It does not scan your AMI. There is a separate CIS benchmark for the AMIs. So a lot of the times I deal with a lot of public sector customers, they have this requirement of STIG, a security technical implementation guide. So if you do have to adhere to STIG implementations, you can use Amazon EC2 Image Builder to build a EC2 image which is TIC compliant, and then you can run HashiCorp Packer to create the AMI to be used with EKS. Alternatively, 
You can subscribe to Stig EC2 AMIs from AWS Marketplace. We have Stig AMI both for Red Hat Enterprise Linux as well as Amazon Linux too. But note that these are still EC2 AMIs. You need to run some process with HashiCorp Packer or Ansible to generate the EKS AMIs. All right, uh, so now let's take a look at pod and runtime security. So this is where your application is running. So the first rule is always use IAM role for service accounts. So let's say your pod, pod A, pod B, pod N is running inside a EC2. And your EC2 has a EC2 IAM role attached. If you don't implement IRSA, then all the pods will inherit all the policies from the EC2 IAM role, which could be too broad, because it is possible that pod A is for one application, pod B is for another application, and you want separate access. With IRSA configured, each pod will have a separate role, and you can control which other resources it can access. So IAM roles for service account map IAM roles to Kubernetes service accounts. It enables least privilege for Kubernetes pods. It is natively supported by Amazon EKS and it is available as open source. Also run dynamic scans. So you could see the similarities uh, between now serverless and container. Remember for serverless, we were scanning uh, lambdas using tools like Twistlock, Aqua, Sneak, etc. Similarly here, you run dynamic scans using these third party tools. And when we talked about image security, we talked about you should always prohibit uh, root usage, uh, privilege escalation. But what if someone created a Docker container image not adhering to the best practices? So during pod and runtime, you can actually control those. So using pod security standards or policy as code, you can validate and deny. Policy as code solutions provide guardrails to guide cluster users and prevent unwanted behaviors to prescribed and automated controls. So how does the flow look like? So let's say uh, you run kubectl apply f with some uh, deployment file. So it sends that manifest file to the API server and API server registers it, writes it to the etcd and then the admission controller comes in. So this admission controller checks whether they are adhering to the best practices and if not, they deny, they deny the privilege escalation or they deny the container to be even provisioned. So using this policy as code, you can deny privilege escalation, you can deny running as root, you can drop Linux capabilities, and you can, one of the example of how to do this is you can implement OPA or open policy agent with Gatekeeper, that's a third party open source tool, or you can use other tools like Kaibarno. Now let's take a look at network security. So when we talk about network security, we mean does this pod have access to invoke another pod? Does this namespace should be allowed to go to another namespace running in the cluster? So you can use security groups for pods to restrict traffic to AWS resources. You can also use Kubernetes network policies to restrict traffic within cluster. This is a very powerful feature. So let's take a look. So let's say uh, you have this uh, namespace and three different uh, pods running, client, front-end, back-end. By default, every traffic is allowed from every pod to other pods. But what if you want the back-end pod to only accept traffic from this front-end pod and nothing else. So you can do that using network policy. So this is a sample network policy. You could say we attach this network policy to the back-end. The pod selector says that this network policy is applied to the back-end pods with by role back-end, and we are only allowing traffic from the pods where it has the label role equal to front-end. So all the other traffic 
will be denied. So two things to keep in mind. Uh, you cannot use network policy and security group together at this point. And another thing is, uh, to do the network uh, policy rules, you need to install a network policy engine like Calico. So you can install it yourself, or you can use one of the EKS blueprints from AWS to create your cluster with Calico and other add-ons. And finally, you can encrypt your traffic in transit. You can terminate HTTPS external traffic at ELB or Elastic Load Balancer. And if you have the requirement to encrypt the traffic in your cluster, you can use service mesh like app mesh for mutual TLS service to service communication. Now we come to audit and forensics. So you should always enable control plane logs, especially API logs. So this way, the control plane logs will go to CloudWatch for you to audit. You can also stream logs from your containers to external log aggregators such as Elasticsearch, Splunk, etc. And you should periodically audit control plane and AWS CloudTrail logs for suspicious activity. And if you find an attack happening, you should immediately isolate the pods if you suspect something has been compromised. So how can you do that? You can change the labels. And remember a couple slides back, we looked at a network policy uh, engine where it's only allowing traffic based on the labels attached to the pod. So as soon as you change the label, network policy will isolate the pods. In case of an instance vulnerability, you can cordon the instance and you can capture volatile artifacts on the worker node, such as memory, disk, to analyze further. So these are just of the few best practices I covered. Uh, there is a EKS security best practices guide published from AWS. I have given the link down below. You can also search it. So what are some of the closing thoughts? Security is everyone's responsibility, right? So now you saw that starting from the container image to running the pod, infrastructure, auditing, and forensic, it touches every layer. Understand the shared responsibility model. Uh, if you don't want to take the overhead of managing AMIs, securing AMIs, uh, use some of the managed offerings, and always shift left and use DevSecOps. By shift left, we mean that security should start in the beginning, such as design phase and development phase, and not only on the after implementation phase. And always DevSecOps, always implement security in your DevOps pipeline. All right, if you want to learn more of EKS, Lambda, ECS, uh, feel free to scan this QR code. We have 500 plus digital uh, free courses and learning plans. And if you are uh, considering getting AWS certification, you can join the AWS certified community and you can get exclusive benefits. All right, with that, I end my session. Uh, uh, you can reach out to me in LinkedIn or my Twitter. With that, uh, happy to take any question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nothing related to the session, but uh, do you have a YouTube channel, Cloud with Raj? I do, I do, uh, yeah. Uh, Thank thanks, uh, I use it a lot. It's, thanks Thank for the... Cool. All right. All right. Enjoy the rest of your summit and uh, have a good long weekend.